When I was 20 years old, I lived in a very small one-bedroom apartment that I had moved into when I turned 18. Having a better job and more money in the bank, I decided to rent a small house and leave the apartment. It wasn't anything fancy, but it had more space and was a nice step up from where I used to live. The only thing I didn't account for was that everything looked off once I set it up. Coming from the apartment, my furniture was way too small and didn't match the interior of the home. It just looked like I moved into a house larger than I could afford. So over the next couple of months, I saved up more money and put it aside to buy new furniture. During these months, I also listed a whole bunch of stuff on Craigslist to start getting rid of. Aside from the couch and a couple of other things, I listed most of the dressers, storage shelves, and other large furnishings for free. I didn't care about getting paid as long as they were able to help me haul it out of my house. I sold and gave away most of the items until only two things were left my old bedroom dresser and a nightstand, which nobody seemed to want. After a month, though, someone finally contacted me about them. They asked if both of them were still available and if they were actually free. I said yes to both, and we agreed on a date for pickup. On that day, I didn't get home from work until an hour before the time they were supposed to come, but when I pulled up to my house, there was a truck in the driveway. I went up beside them and looked in the window, but nobody was inside. I opened the garage and parked, then went back outside to further inspect the random truck in my driveway. When I looked this time though, someone was in the car. They waved and got out, introducing themselves as the person from Craigslist here to pick up the furniture. I took a second to react because I was trying to figure out where they were when I pulled in. You're an hour early. I said to meet at 7.30, he said he was sorry, but something came up, so he needed to come early. I still didn't understand why he didn't text me before coming unannounced, but since he was here, I showed him inside. He looked at the items for a second and said he'd take them. I helped him haul out the large dresser and put it in his truck bed. We went back in for the nightstand, but as he picked it up, a shuffling sound came from downstairs followed by a quiet thump. I looked down the staircase, then back at the man who was now looking at me in a very unsettling way. Everything okay, he said in a very monotone voice. I hesitantly nodded and walked downstairs, showing him out. I closed the door behind him and watched out the window to make sure that he left. That whole interaction was very odd from beginning to end, but what I found after was horrifying. Later that night, I saw a small streak on the wall just outside one of the downstairs closets like someone had brushed against it. I looked around some more, finding very faint shoe prints inside the closet. Someone had clearly been hiding in there. I put two and two together, and I was pretty sure there was another person in my house, along with the man. They broke in before I got home from work, and when they heard me pulling into the driveway, one of them hid in the closet while the other went back to the car. The shuffling sound I heard toward the end was likely the other person leaving the closet. I had the police do what they could, but the two men seemed to cover up their tracks. I gave them descriptions of the one man I saw and the truck he was driving, but that was that. It was a terrible experience and after that I only used Craigslist when I could avoid meeting at my house. Otherwise, I would just donate things or buy stuff off eBay. It feels like nowadays, anyone can do anything and get away with it so easily as long as they plan ahead. Back in the day, around eight years ago, Craigslist was a very normal service I used every time I had something to sell or needed something to buy on a budget. I lived in a nice town and was mostly okay with meeting new people and doing a quick exchange. At the time, I was looking for a treadmill or an elliptical. Both of these were really expensive to buy new, but used ones in good condition were often sold on Craigslist 
sometimes for just a couple of hundred bucks. I scrolled through a few posts and found what I liked the look of. I sent the seller a message, and the following day they replied. The seller, Mike, assured me the treadmill was in like new condition, and we arranged to meet later that day. The address he gave me was on the edge of town, just 20 or so minutes away. When I pulled up, I was surprised to see that it was a farmhouse with a huge lot of land surrounding it, but no crops or anything. I drove down the long driveway and parked in the front yard next to several other trucks and cars that were in the yard. Mike was outside on the porch smoking when I walked up. He shook my hand and led me around the back of the house to his garage, where the treadmill was set up right in the middle, plugged in and everything. He leaned against the far wall and encouraged me to test it out. I got on and put it on a walking speed. It seemed to be working just fine, but then I turned it up a little, and it just shut off. I looked at it confusingly, and before I could even figure out what happened, the garage door suddenly fell down behind me, slamming against the ground. It was so loud my heart was racing from the jump scare it gave me. I turned and looked at Mike, who shrugged and apologized, saying it was an old garage and it happened sometimes. I looked back and a cold shiver ran through me, noticing the position I was in. So, did you want it? Um, no, I don't think it works. I was nervous to give that answer, but there was no way I would pay for that. He looked at me without saying anything. After a second, I broke eye contact, feeling a strange tension. Not a problem. I'll show you out, he said, waving me to follow him through the house. With no other way out, I followed. The house was very old looking on the inside, like a farmhouse from the 1900s, except it was really messy. Stuff was piled up all around the walls and even blocking some of the hallways. He walked me down to the front door and stopped right in front of it. There was a long pause as he faced the door, not opening it. He then turned to me. I'm sorry, he said under his breath like an emotionless psychopath. My body went cold in that moment, knowing something was about to happen. The man quickly stepped toward me, grabbing my arm and forcing me back deeper into the house. I started yelling, fighting his grip and trying to get away. He pushed me down the hallway, almost back to the garage door, until I suddenly tripped over one of the random things that were piled up. When I fell, he lost his balance too, falling past me. I quickly got up and ran down to the front door, unlocking it and running to my truck. As I backed out, the man came rushing out of the front door and sprinting at my truck. I was able to get away, but my hands were shaking on the steering wheel all the way home. I of course notified the police, but things didn't go how I expected. When they got there, nobody answered the door at the farmhouse. The man never turned up. The vehicles parked on the lot, though, were all found to be unregistered and missing license plates. However, one of them was identified as a recently stolen car. Whoever that man I met with was, he wasn't the owner of the farmhouse. The owner actually lived in a neighboring city, having inherited the land from their parents. They hadn't had the chance to sell it, so they just used it as temporary storage or something. This happened many years ago, and the man never turned up, so I know it's a lost cause, but it's still scary knowing he's out there. I don't know what he was trying to do to me back then or what he still might be trying to do to other people now. I had heard warnings before about using Craigslist people getting scammed, robbed, or even worse. But I was desperate. I needed a new apartment ASAP, and my budget was tight, so I took a chance and started browsing the housing section on Craigslist. I came across a listing for a small apartment in an old building downtown. The rent was cheap, and the location was perfect for my job. I emailed the owner, and he responded quickly. 
We discussed the time to meet up, and a couple of days later, I drove over there. When I arrived at the apartment building, I couldn't help but feel a bit let down. The old brick facade was crumbling, and the windows were old and dirty, one of them even boarded up. I climbed the stairs up to the second floor and knocked on the door of apartment 2 billion. The man opened the door, and I was surprised by how friendly he was. He showed me around the apartment, which was small but still nice. It was in good condition, and I could tell that he put a lot of work into it. He told me he was renovating the whole building and that the construction noise would only be temporary. We talked some more and discussed the price, and I ended up taking the deal. Later in the week, I moved in and set everything up. Every time I saw the outside of the building, I couldn't believe I was living in a place that looked like that, but I just had to remind myself that it was the inside that counted. Three weeks went by, no problems or concerns about the place until I started to realize something nobody else seemed to live in the building. I never saw anyone parked outside or walking inside, and I never heard anyone through the thin walls. Additionally, I never heard any construction going on like the owner had said there would be. I kept these thoughts in the back of my mind until one morning when leaving for work. I saw one of the other room's doors was partially open. I walked past it and went about my day, but when I got back later that night, it was still open. After some thought, I figured it had to be vacant. I pushed it more open. Inside the room was dusty and smelled awful. There were webs and stains all over the walls, and it looked like it had been abandoned for years. I stepped out and closed the door, disgusted that there was a room in the building I lived in that looked like that. I went up to my room, but before I walked in, I became curious about the other rooms. I knocked on my neighbor's door, 2A, and nobody answered. I turned the handle, and it was unlocked. I pushed open the door. The room was the same as the other one, looking to have been abandoned for years. I became really uncomfortable and went back to my room. I contacted the owner, sending him a text asking if any of the other rooms were ready to be rented out. While my room was nice, it felt like I was living alone in an abandoned building, which was really eerie and uncomforting. I waited for the man to respond, but ten minutes later, I heard the front door to the building open. He walked up to my door and knocked. Hello, who is it? I asked before opening the door. He responded and I recognized his voice as the owner. I opened the door. I saw your text and thought I'd just come in person, he said, smiling. I nervously smiled back, saying I was just curious about the other rooms. I didn't want to say I went inside them because I probably wasn't supposed to. He maintained his smile. Why don't I show you one of the rooms I'm finishing up? I reluctantly followed him across the hall. But then he stopped by apartment 2A, the room I'd just been in. He pushed open the door and walked in, telling me to come inside and have a look. I stayed, thinking of an excuse, but then he told me again and again, now demanding me to come in. I backed away and ran back to my room, locking the door behind me. I heard him rushing down the stairs and out of the building. After I was sure he left, I started packing up everything, and the next day I left and never looked back. I never saw that man again, and I never went back to Craigslist for anything. To this day, I still wonder what that building actually was and what the owner was plotting. If I had stepped into that room with him, would I have ever been able to leave? My name is Amy and I wanted to share my traumatic experience buying a house on Craigslist that ended up being a total scam. This turned into an absolute nightmare situation that cost my husband Jack and I our entire life savings. Looking back, there were so many red flags that we obliviously ignored in our excitement to become homeowners. Jack and I had been renting a cramped one-bedroom apartment in downtown Kansas City for over five years 
We were finally at a financially stable point in our careers to start looking for our first home to purchase. I was casually browsing Craigslist real estate listings one Saturday morning, not really expecting to find anything good, but suddenly an ad popped up for a gorgeous four-bedroom, two-bath house in a quiet Kansas City suburb. The ad included stunning photos showing hardwood floors throughout, a big backyard with a deck, and tons of natural light. It was listed at an unbelievably cheap price of only $175,000, which I thought was odd. I immediately called the number to get more details. A friendly voice named Linda answered and explained the home belonged to her elderly uncle. She said he had passed away recently and she was selling it for him to quickly close out his estate. When I asked why the large house was listed so far below market value, Linda claimed her uncle wanted it sold fast and easy without any hassles. She said he had lived there over 30 years, and it was completely move and ready after having a top to bottom renovation. I was instantly intrigued and told my husband Jack about it when he got home from work. He was dubious at first, but agreed it seemed worth looking into as the price was so tempting. We arranged a showing for the very next day. When we pulled up to the house, it looked exactly like the photos, a charming two-story home with a big front porch. Linda greeted us at the door and gave us a quick tour of the interior. The inside was just as lovely as she had described over the phone. Everything looked freshly updated with nice finishes. We fell absolutely in love with it and decided to put in an offer on the spot before someone else snatched it up. Linda seemed thrilled we weren't even asking to negotiate the price down. She raved about what amazing new homeowners we would be. In our excitement, Jack and I ignored some big warning signs, but at the time we were just so thrilled to finally achieve our dream of owning our own home after years stuck renting. I now realize Linda deliberately exploited our emotional desire to finally become homeowners. She expertly manipulated our enthusiasm to blind us to the sketchy details. Linda quickly emailed over a standard purchase contract saying we would buy the house for the full asking price of $175,000. It required us to wire the complete funds to an escrow account to secure the sale. She claimed it had to be done this way since her uncle was deceased. Again, we foolishly rushed through signing the contract electronically and wired the money without thinking twice. We didn't even hire a real estate lawyer to review the documents, which was incredibly stupid. Linda reassured us multiple times that this was a legitimate process and there was nothing to worry about. The supposed closing date arrived a few days later. Linda texted me saying she had left the front door unlocked and we could go inside the house now since it officially was ours. She also provided the garage code and instructed us to promptly change all the locks for security. Jack and I were absolutely exhilarated. We immediately drove over and changed out all the locks, so excited to finally have our own house. We started moving in boxes and planning renovations we wanted to do. Two days later, I was inside unpacking when I heard loud, authoritative knocking at the front door. I opened it to find two police officers standing there along with an older man and woman. The officers had grave expressions and the couple looked upset. My heart immediately sank. The police explained that the elderly man was the actual legal owner of the house. He had just returned from a long vacation to find strangers living in his home that had all the locks changed. The true owner was alarmed someone had sold his house without permission while he was away. The officers asked for proof we had purchased the home. Of course we had nothing legitimate except phony documents Linda had fabricated and emailed to us. The owner was furious that his family member Linda had totally betrayed his trust. She had been house-sitting while he vacationed but instead callously sold off his home and pocketed the money after deceiving us. The police regretfully informed us there was likely nothing they could do since we had willingly wired the funds without doing proper due diligence. We were likely responsible. The owner firmly demanded we vacate immediately 
and threatened to press charges if we refused. Utterly embarrassed and devastated, we silently gathered up our boxes and left. I was nearly in tears as the reality sunk in that we were now out $175,000. All our hard-earned savings were gone, and we still had no home of our own. We clearly should have had a lawyer thoroughly vet the documents Linda sent before blindly trusting her, but we let emotions cloud our judgment and ignored obvious warning signs. We were too caught up in the thrill of achieving our dream of home ownership. The incredibly cheap price should have been a clear red flag that something was amiss, but in our excitement, we didn't stop to consider the situation rationally. This painful experience taught me valuable lessons. I learned to never trust strangers implicitly or make major financial decisions when under strong emotions. It's easy to get caught up in fantasies and blind yourself to dishonest schemes. We clearly failed to do proper research to validate Linda's claims, which cost us everything. I'll also never make a big transaction on Craigslist again without verifying credentials. There are dishonest people out there ready to manipulate those who are vulnerable or desperate. I hope others can avoid the mistakes we made and not get swindled by scams. Don't ignore warning signs or let emotions overwhelm your judgment. Losing our life savings due to our own foolishness and impulsiveness was devastating, but by sharing my story, maybe others can be spared this financial and emotional trauma. I learned the hard way that if something seems too good to be true, it usually is. Always thoroughly verify before sending money to strangers, or you may end up in your own horror story. Our dream of home ownership quickly turned into a nightmare all because we failed to heed obvious red flags when we had the chance. I hope my painful experience can help prevent others from becoming manipulation victims too. I'll never forget the fateful day I responded to that suspicious Craigslist ad. Money was tight as a single mom, so I jumped at the chance for an affordable at-home haircut from someone calling themselves Freddy. Little did I know I was walking into a nightmare from which I'd never fully awaken. The ad was vague, simply advertising haircuts for dirt cheap in a sketchy part of town. My desperation overruled my better judgment. Arriving at the faded apartment building, I hesitated before knocking on a chipped door. Muffled crashes came from inside, setting my nerves on edge. When the door creaked open, a wild-eyed woman peered out. Her own hair was a tangled bird's nest piled haphazardly on her head. She greeted me eagerly, beckoning me inside the dim, cluttered space. I nearly tripped over the piles of magazines and takeout containers lining the stained carpet. The whole apartment reeked of stale air, cigarettes, and hair dye. Freddie gestured toward a rickety folding chair in the center of the room. Trimmings from past victims littered the floor around it. As I reluctantly sat, she whipped out a cape and fastened it tightly around my neck. Her movements were jerky and erratic, like a puppet controlled by unseen strings. Freddie hummed an eerie, off-key tune as she surveyed my hair, running her fingers through it aggressively. Her cracked nails snagged, making me wince. Meeting my eyes in the grimy mirror, she gave a yellow-toothed grin that sent a chill down my spine. Don't worry, honey, you're in good hands, Freddie rasped though her crazy expression suggested otherwise. I forced a polite smile in return, praying this would be over quickly. She hacked away aggressively at my hair, shearing off huge chunks with reckless abandon. I sat rigid, not daring to move or complain as she wielded the scissors maniacally. The clipping and snipping were punctuated by her off-key humming, which gradually became more agitated. My scalp stung as Freddie yanked my hair this way, and that focused intently on her work. After what felt like an eternity, she spun me to face the spotted mirror. My heart sank at the lopsided, uneven disaster atop my head. 
Patches of raw scalp peeked through marks of her clippers' unsteady dance. I looked like I'd been mauled by a rabid dog. Meeting my eyes in the reflection, Freddy gave another unsettling grin. I chose my words carefully, not wanting to provoke her. It's quite a bit shorter than I expected, I said, forcing a polite smile. Freddy's cheerful facade evaporated, replaced by deranged fury. Shorter than you expected, she thundered. I cowered as she loomed over me, ranting and raving. Her voice grew louder and more shrill. Spittle flew from her mouth as she gesticulated wildly. Backing away, I searched frantically for escape as her tirade went on, but she had me trapped in that chair. Then Freddy pulled out a can of pepper spray from her pocket and unleashed it at my face. The piercing burn consumed my senses. I screamed, my eyes and throat on fire, as I bolted blindly for the door. Freddy's crazed laughter echoed as I stumbled down the trash-strewn hallway. Blinking tears and gasping for air, I finally burst out of the apartment building and into the harsh sunlight. I didn't stop running until I reached my car. As I sobbed hysterically, it was clear I'd narrowly escaped a lunatic's clutches. My ravaged hair was the least of my worries. Shaken to my core, I drove straight to the police station to file a report. They listened sympathetically but said there was little they could do without a full name or more information. I never returned to that sketchy apartment. It took weeks for my eyes and lungs to heal from the pepper spray. The horrifying experience haunted me for years, a constant reminder to always trust my instincts. I'll never forget that crazed look in Freddy's eyes or how I barely escaped her clutches. I can remember the night I matched with Greg on Tinder like it was yesterday. What began with exciting potential quickly devolved into a harrowing ordeal I'll never forget. Greg seemed normal enough in his profile pictures handsome, smiling, and well-dressed. His bio described him as a fun-loving guy looking for a meaningful connection. We exchanged a few flirty messages and quickly made plans to meet in person. He suggested a new restaurant downtown that I'd been dying to try, which seemed promising. When I arrived, Greg was already seated at a table, scrolling through his phone. He looked up and flashed me a charming smile as I approached. But as the night progressed, red flags kept popping up. First, he ordered for both of us without consulting me, which I found presumptuous. Then, he spent the entire meal talking about himself and name-dropping celebrities he supposedly knew. I barely got a word in edgewise. Despite my growing unease, I decided to give him the benefit of the doubt. Maybe he was just nervous and trying too hard to impress me. After dinner, Greg suggested going back to his place for a nightcap. Though I wasn't entirely comfortable, I agreed reluctantly. His apartment was surprisingly sparse and unkempt. Empty takeout containers and clothes littered the floor. As he made us drinks, I noticed a strange, pungent odor wafting from the bedroom. Greg came back with two glasses of wine, but my gut told me something was off. I took a small sip while he downed as in one gulp, then excused myself to use the bathroom. Once inside, I locked the door and called my best friend, Gina, to let her know where I was. She agreed to stay on the line while I made my escape. When I emerged, Greg's demeanor had shifted dramatically. His charming facade was replaced with an aggressive, predatory gaze. He demanded to know why I was in the bathroom so long and accused me of snooping. My heart raced as he backed me into a corner his eyes wild. I stammered an excuse and tried to push past him, but he grabbed my arm tightly. Gina's voice in my ear kept me grounded as I struggled to stay calm. Summoning all my strength, I yanked free and bolted for the door. Greg's shouts followed me as I sprinted down the hallway and out of the building. 
I didn't stop running until I reached my car, hands shaking as I fumbled with the keys. Once inside, I locked the doors and sped away, sobbing in relief. Gina stayed on the phone, reassuring me until I got home safely. I reported Greg to Tinder and the police, but the trauma of that night stayed with me. The memory of his crazed eyes and tight grip still haunts my nightmares. I've become much more cautious with online dating, always meeting in public places and trusting my instincts. I'll never forget how narrowly I escaped Greg's sinister intentions. Back in college, I was always looking for ways to make extra cash. So when I saw a Craigslist ad for a babysitting job that paid generously, I jumped at the chance. The ad was vague, but mentioned needing an experienced sitter for a six-year-old boy named Timmy. I emailed the poster, who quickly replied, setting up an interview at their home. I felt a little uneasy about the lack of details, but brushed it off thinking it was just an overworked single parent in need. The house was a large old Victorian in a quiet neighborhood. When I knocked, a woman in her late forties answered, introducing herself as Mrs. Abernathy. She looked exhausted, with deep circles under her eyes and an air of frazzled nerves. She led me inside to meet Timmy, who was playing quietly in the living room. He seemed shy but sweet, barely looking up from his toys. Mrs. Abernathy explained that she worked nights and needed someone to watch Timmy until she returned in the early morning. She offered to pay me handsomely for my time, which I eagerly accepted. After a quick rundown of his bedtime routine, she left for work, and I settled in for the night. As the hours passed, Timmy and I played games, read books, and watched a movie. By 9 p.m., it was time for bed. He obediently climbed under the covers, and I tucked him in, turning off the light. I settled on the couch with my homework, but strange noises soon interrupted my concentration. Faint whispers and soft footsteps seemed to come from the hallway. I dismissed it as an old house settling, trying to focus on my studies. But the noises grew louder, more insistent. I got up to investigate, heart pounding. When I reached the hallway, it was empty, but a chill ran down my spine. Returning to the living room, I found Timmy standing in the doorway, eyes wide with fear. There's a man in my room, he whispered, voice trembling. I froze, blood running cold. Timmy pointed toward his bedroom, and I reluctantly crept down the hall peeking inside. The room was empty, but the window was open, curtains billowing in the breeze. I closed and locked it, reassuring Timmy it was just the wind. But as I led him back to bed, I couldn't shake the feeling we weren't alone. The whispers seemed to follow us, growing louder and more distinct. Timmy clung to me, too scared to let go. We huddled together on the couch every creak and groan of the house setting me on edge. I kept my phone close, ready to call 911 at the slightest hint of danger. Around 2 a.m., the front door creaked open. I jumped up, ready to protect Timmy, but it was just Mrs. Abernathy returning from work. She looked more exhausted than ever, barely acknowledging me as she handed over the cash. I tried to tell her about the noises and Timmy's fear, but she brushed it off, saying the house was old and creaky. I left, vowing not to return. But that night haunted me. I couldn't shake the feeling something sinister lurked in that old Victorian house. Timmy's terrified whispers echoed in my mind. To this day, I wonder if I narrowly escaped a more terrifying fate. I'll never forget the eerie whispers the phantom footsteps, and the palpable sense of dread that filled that house. It was a babysitting gig from hell, one that left me with lasting chills and a heightened sense of caution. Looking to furnish my new apartment on a budget, 
I turned to Craigslist for some cheap finds. One ad caught my eye a free couch in excellent condition, if I could just come pick it up. It seemed too good to be true, but I couldn't pass up the offer. The poster. A man named Rick provided an address in a nearby neighborhood. I arranged to meet him the next day, eager to score some free furniture. When I arrived, the house looked run down with peeling paint and overgrown weeds. I hesitated, but Rick came out to greet me, waving me inside. He seemed friendly enough, though a bit rough around the edges. We made small talk as he led me to the basement where the couch was stored. The dimly lit, cluttered space set me on edge, but I followed him down the creaky stairs. The couch was indeed in great condition, almost too good to be sitting in a basement like this. I inspected it, running my hand over the soft fabric. Rick offered to help me carry it up to my truck, which I gratefully accepted. As we lifted the couch, I noticed the basement door slowly closing. A jolt of fear shot through me. I turned to see another man standing at the top of the stairs, a sinister smile on his face. Panic set in as I realized I was trapped. Rick's friendly demeanor vanished, replaced by a menacing glare. My mind raced, searching for an escape. With adrenaline-fueled strength, I shoved the couch into Rick, knocking him off balance. He stumbled, giving me just enough time to sprint up the stairs. The second man lunged at me, but I ducked under his arm, bolting for the door. I burst outside, heart pounding, and didn't stop running until I reached my truck. Fumbling with the keys, I managed to start the engine and sped away, glancing back to see Rick and his accomplice watching from the doorway. I didn't stop driving until I was safely home, doors locked and blinds drawn. Shaken, I reported the incident to the police, giving them the address and descriptions of the men. They took my statement but warned me these types of Craigslist scams were all too common. The experience left me paranoid and distrustful of online deals. I learned the hard way to always bring someone with me and to meet in public places. The free couch trap was a terrifying reminder that not everything on Craigslist is as it seems. I'll never forget the sinister smiles of those men and how close I came to becoming their victim. It was the third year of college when I switched from living in a dorm to a place off campus. The past year I had spent as a residential advisor to earn some spare cash, but two weeks before the start of the semester my boss was fired and a new supervisor was hired. My old boss had lost much of the documentation, including the papers that stated I had worked for the past year, and in the transition, I found myself without income or living space for the coming year. After a few unsuccessful calls, I determined none of them had a vacancy available. I cursed myself for not moving off campus the year prior and reluctantly logged into Craigslist. My college is in a city, and it is an expensive city. The exorbitant prices at bars had already given me some first-hand experience with the cost of living, but it did little to dull the shock of rent prices. Rooms half the size of my dorm were double the cost, and a personal bathroom quickly became a luxury my wallet could not support. I spent an hour poring over listings, checking different combinations of keywords, locations, and price ranges before I finally found a property worth looking into. I stared at the page, trying to see if the landlord had forgotten to tack on an extra zero. The description was for an entire three-story house, only $400 per month, and even included a pool in the back. After a minute, I read the last few lines and realized the reason why it was so cheap the tenant must be willing to perform regular chores around the house, including pool maintenance, lawn maintenance, and maid services. I work night shift, so the tenant must be willing to perform these actions during the day to be completed by each night. 
I smiled. Compared to the students I had to handle as a residential advisor, a little work around the house would be a small task. Plus, my family had owned a small pool growing up, and I had kept it clean throughout high school. With a few keystrokes, I replied to the ad, and by the next morning, I had an email in my inbox inviting me to view the property. It was a 15-minute bike ride from campus, located deep in the back of a middle-class neighborhood with more speed bumps than houses. A cluster of massive oak trees stood on either side of the drive, and a concrete pathway led to the door, which was answered by a man in jeans who looked to be in his 50s. Hello there, said the man, opening the door wide with a gloved hand. His gaze lingered on me, seeming to spend time in areas it shouldn't, as if you were seeing a human for the first time and was not sure what traits to look for. Here to answer the Craigslist ad, I said, peering past him. The house looked clean enough from where I was standing, and behind me, there was not much yard to maintain besides raking the leaves. Ah, yes, he said. Come in, come in. My name is Jefferson, but I prefer to be called Jack. Luke, I said, stepping inside. The floors were wooden, and the frame of the door had been scratched and dented from years of use. The interior looked aged but kept in well-conditioned, such well-conditioned, that I wondered why he inquired for a housekeeper. He led me down a hallway into the kitchen, gesturing for me to sit at the table. He took the chair opposite me, and when he moved it seemed stiff, an odd mechanical movement that I attributed to old joints. Before I go over the terms of the lease, we have to go over some ground rules. I assume you read I expect housework to be performed, yes. That's not a problem. Good. Second rule is that since I work night shift, I may have some visitors in the late hours of the night before you wake up. It would be he paused, choosing his words quite embarrassing for my acquaintances to see that I can no longer adequately care for myself, and they may go as far as to doubt the state of my finances. I ask that if we awaken you that you stay in your room until morning to allow me to save face, not a problem. I'm typically a deep sleeper. Ah, yes, good. That's splendid, he said, nodding his head vigorously, then continued. One more thing. Due to tax purposes, it would be highly beneficial if you were to have already lived here for the past two years. I'd be willing to refund you an extra $150 a month if you could backdate these forms and sign, as if you actually have been living here for some time. I would prefer not to be caught by the IRS though, so do you know if others have documentation stating you have lived elsewhere? Typically I would choose to follow the law, but $150 extra a month meant my diet of ramen could be expanded into subsistence not resembling processed cardboard. Additionally, this put a positive spin on my boss having lost my records. I'm in. Where do I have to sign? He pulled a stack of papers previously prepared, and I signed and dated each. Two weeks later, I added a few scrapes to those present on the door frame when I moved my furniture inside and placed $250 in assorted bills into Jack's gloved hand. That afternoon, he showed me how to maintain the pool and I learned of the significance of the gloves. This pool was built by my father for my mother back in the 60s. She loved it very much, and I do say I have more memories of her in the pool than out of it. It's sentimental, and so I want it kept in prime condition. The size of my father's heart starkly contrasts his skills in construction. So the levels of chemicals have to be kept quite stable. They are controlled by this box he gestured to an aluminum box with a pipe that led into the ground and must be manually filled daily. He then showed me where to dump powder into slots in the box, then showed me a sign-off list where I should note the levels of powder available in storage. The lids would have to be closed tight or they would attract moisture from the air and become useless. It was unlike any setup I had ever seen archaic in its design but seemed simple enough. 
Unfortunately, I have a condition where I cannot handle these chemicals, and the slightest change in pH affects my skin. I'm sure you've noticed my gloves, and that is why I keep them on, as my skin will crack otherwise. We retreated back into the house, and he gave me instructions on the other household chores before leaving me to unpack my belongings. I explored the house sometimes while he was gone, including the extensive basement where I washed my clothes with a small exercise rack in the corner. There was a portrait on the wall of Jack with his mother and father, both deceased. His father resembled Jack, and his mother looked plain and dressed plainly besides a golden necklace that ended in a heart at her throat. Next to the exercise rack, there was an open doorway that led down into a single room second basement with moist floors and no working light bulbs. An enormous atlas spanned an entire wall, but besides the map, the room was empty besides a small buzzing. I never spent more than five minutes in the atlas room. It was too desolate, too dark, accompanied by a feeling that I simply did not belong. The school semester then started, and I saw little of Jack as the days turned to weeks. But as little as I saw him, the eccentricities of his lifestyle appeared everywhere. First, there was the cleaning. Unlike normal housework, Jack had me scrub the walls, wipe down tables, and even dust individual objects several times over when there was no residue. He claimed this was due to a severe allergy to dust mites, but never had I seen him exhibit these symptoms. Twice I forgot to refill the pool chemicals, and each time the pool changed from clear to a dark murk in the span of hours, and I changed the chemicals before Jack could notice. Then there were the visitors. Nearly always, I could hear the voice of a woman or women, her voice tinkling down the hallway. I never saw her, but I cleaned up after them in the morning, moving cups to the sink and capping the expensive bottles that were Jack's favorite drink. Sometimes I'd see undergarments, and I would move these to the door of Jack's bedroom, where he would remove them by the next morning. Once I joked about how much more often he had female companions than I, but he cracked an odd smile and said in a low voice, one day, Luke, I'll teach you to have women swimming all around you. But these were mere oddities, strange doings that were Jack's business and not mine until one night. One night that I will never forget, that sends chills up my spine to this day and causes me to double check the functionality of my deadbolt. That night I was awakened by a tornado siren at one in the morning, a howling that matched the sound of the wind as it buffeted the sides of the house. I stayed in bed, trying to outlast the siren, but my window shattered in a sharp gust and sprayed me with a mixture of water and glass. I shouted in surprise, then threw off my blankets and headed to the basement, where it would be safest in the storm. Jack did not usually arrive home until at least three, and the storm should blow over by then. I shivered as I ran down the steps and sat on the workout equipment near the Atlas room. Above me, rain splashed against a high window, and after a few minutes I moved down the steps into the Atlas room for fear this window would break as well. I sat in a corner and curled myself into a ball to keep warm, only to find the air grew colder and colder and colder. After some time I stood up to leave and realized the door had swung shut behind me. The door was metal, and it took some time before I forced it open. I had almost left the room when I noticed the door to the electrical box was ajar. I turned the corner and saw several switches had been turned to the off position. I flipped them all back up and heard the click of the basement door behind me. The siren was winding down, but the hum of the wind grew louder, a rising buzz. It was only then that I realized the sound did not come from outside but from the room itself. A quick sweep of the room yielded nothing, but the atlas seemed far too loud for it to be a natural noise. I placed a hand on the wall and found the sound was actually coming from within. Without knowing what I was doing, I pulled the edge of the map back, revealing not the plaster of the basement wall, but a narrow hallway. 
It was large enough for a person to stand, and the wind was roaring from somewhere within. I squinted into the darkness, took a deep breath, then walked inside. The darkness became complete behind me, and the narrow opening led into a much larger room, an underground pool, and Jack was inside. He floated in the water, surrounded by four women who swam past and around him in sweeping circles. A shiver took hold of me, and I turned to leave. It was then Jack noticed me. He threw his head back and laughed, a deep bellowing sound that echoed off the ceiling. He raised his hand, and the four women turned and started to swim in my direction. Their faces were as white as bone and froze in the image of human faces. There was no sparkle in their eyes, no natural movement of the lips. They shot through the water, and as they rose from the sides, I saw they had no legs. The bottom halves were the body of a fish. In an instant, I was up the stairs and out of the Atlas room, and I slammed the door shut behind me. I bolted into the backyard, only to see the surface pool light up and the same four women swimming at the top. Jack emerged from the water and I ran back inside, screaming, only to be stopped by Jack's hand on my shoulder. I did not wait to see if his gloves were on or off. I yanked free and ran inside, locking my bedroom door and huddling against the wall. Outside, I could hear him shouting, but I stayed inside until the next day. It was my luck Jack's window had been shattered too, but no damage had been done to the rest of the house. He was gone when I emerged, so I took the chance to collect my things and leave. Three weeks later, I saw his name in the paper. He had been arrested for possession of illegal substances, 